Our second lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified to him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks ahead of me, because he was before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. The law indeed was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. It is God, the only Son, who is close to the Father's heart, who has made him known. This morning we also have a third reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, for there was no place for them in the inn. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I wonder if you're feeling a little restless right now after those readings. After all, it is January 4th, I know that, not December 24th. And if you're anything like me, you have had enough Christmas, or at least enough of the cultural trappings of the holiday. Christmas music has been playing since the day after Halloween in many stores. Christmas trees and Christmas lights went up for many on the day after Thanksgiving. It's a new year and we're getting ready to get back to life as usual, to put away the decorations, send the trees to the curb, toss out the rest of the cookies, put Christmas back in storage until it's time to pull it out again next year. But then we came to church and lo and behold, it's still Christmas. We have trees, we have candles, although you have to imagine them being lit this morning. We have poinsettias, we have Christmas carols. As usual, the church is on a different schedule than the rest of the world. The church celebrated its new year back on November 30th with the first Sunday of Advent. And according to the church calendar, Christmas isn't over for two more days until January 6th, the Feast of Epiphany, when the wise men come to visit the baby Jesus. So according to the church calendar, there is still time to ponder the incarnation, that as John puts it, the word became flesh and lived among us. Some years ago, when I ran the middle school youth group at a Presbyterian church, we spent an evening during Advent creating our own nativity. 
After talking about the fact that the biblical accounts of Jesus' birth involve people at the very bottom of the socioeconomic ladder, the young, unwed peasant Mary and her fiancé Joseph, hard-working shepherds, we made a nativity scene out of trash. Yes, you heard me right, out of trash. Whatever trash we could find in our student center was fair game for this nativity. The students quickly decided that the leftover banana pepper in our pizza box would make the perfect baby Jesus, and they plopped him down in the container of garlic butter for a manger. Empty water bottles carefully clothed in plastic wrappers became Mary and Joseph, and angels were fashioned out of some discarded stones with paper napkin wings. Crumpled up chips became hay on the stable floor, and a broken ping pong ball, a balled up piece of paper, and some masking tape turned into a sheep. It was an irreverent nativity, to be sure, And it's the kind of thing that seems to have nothing to do with the opening of John's gospel, the only place John even comes close to talking about Jesus' birth. John's opening is all poetry and majesty, the beginning of creation, light and darkness, God in flesh and blood, grace and truth. This is no description of God coming to earth through the lowest of the low. This is serious theology mystery and majesty and glory. I'm not so sure John would approve of our trash nativity. But there is something comforting to us about descriptions of Jesus' birth that focus on the everyday details. Mystery and majesty and glory and poetry are all well and good, especially on Christmas Eve. But now, 10 days later, I think we need something more concrete. That's why I decided that today John needed to be balanced by the Gospel of Luke, whose description of the birth involves real people with real problems. One of my favorite children's book is simply called The Nativity. The words are taken straight from Luke's Gospel, describing the angel Gabriel's visit to Mary, Joseph and Mary's journey to Bethlehem, the shepherd's visit from the angels. But these familiar words from the biblical account are accompanied by drawings depicting utterly normal people. The angel Gabriel has on big boots and his wings are so huge that they have a tendency to get caught in tree limbs and on clotheslines. When Gabriel breaks the news to Mary about the baby in her womb, he does it at her kitchen table over mugs of steaming hot coffee so that they look exactly like a couple of gossiping housewives. Mary looks astonished but delighted to hear Gabriel's announcement and the excitement on her face when she tells Joseph is palpable. Then there's a page of drawings of Mary growing rounder and rounder and looking as proud as any new pregnant mama would. When she and Joseph are journeying to Bethlehem, she is so hugely pregnant You can't help but feel sorry for the donkey who has to carry her. Best of all, after the birth, instead of sitting upright and stoic like in so many nativity paintings, she is clearly exhausted but overjoyed, slumped back against Joseph's chest as they both look down at the newborn baby Jesus, drunk with love for him. Yes, as John reminds us, the Incarnation was an unparalleled event in the history of the universe. The wonder and power and glory of God was enfleshed in a newborn baby. But in order for this to happen, it had to involve what Luke describes, people just like us. People who sometimes get so caught up in the details of our everyday lives that it might just take a bizarre looking angel forcing us to sit down at the table with a steaming cup of coffee before we will pay attention to what God is up to. Father Gregory Boyle, who has worked for years with gang members in the projects of Los Angeles, tells of the time he took Julian and Matteo two 19-year-olds who used to belong to rival gangs, to Helena, Montana, where Father Boyle spoke about his ministry and Julian and Mateo spoke about gang life 
what it was like having spent nearly a quarter of their lives incarcerated, and what it took to start over and make a new life. Before their talk at the university, the boys and Boyle are interviewed and photographed by the local paper. Their talk is a rousing success, and the next day, on the front page of the Helena paper, above the fold, is a picture of Boyle, Julian, and Matteo standing with their arms around each other and grinning. The boys are treated like celebrities as they head home the next day at the hotel, at the restaurant, in the airport. People stop them and shake their hands and congratulate them, tell them how much they admire their courage. On the airplane, in the middle of the flight, Boyle looks across the aisle at the boys. Julian is sound asleep, but Matteo is sitting there crying silently, tears running down his cheeks. What's wrong? Boyle asks. Matteo has the newspaper in his lap. I just read the article again, he says. For a moment, he can't speak. Then, I don't know, it really gets to me. Makes me feel like I'm somebody. He cries even more, and Boyle leans across the aisle, looks him in the eye, and says, maybe because you are somebody. The world we live in and the people who live in it, including us, are not trash as far as God is concerned, far from it. The absurdity and the wonder of the incarnation is that it shows us a God willing to abandon heaven for earth, trading in power and glory for diapers and a teething ring. It is a radical endorsement of all this, this messed up world we don't know how to fix, these lives of ours that are by turns achingly dull and blissfully sublime. In Jesus, we discover that God cares enough about us and our struggles to experience them with us. As one preacher puts it, God's desire to be near us was so great. He came down from heaven and lived and loved and suffered and rejoiced and did the dishes and caught the flu and waited in line and told jokes. God knows what it is to be human. In Jesus, through Jesus, God understands suffering and pain, sorrow and loss. In Jesus, through Jesus, God understands all of it. Amen.